good. Hopefully, you can see my screen. I thought um, I thought to frame this uh, this talk um, so you, you'll see that this is about uh, decentralized semantics. So I thought the best thing to do is kind of frame this as a, a give an overview of a dynamic data economy, um, and that's really a, a decentralized trust infrastructure for safe and secure data exchange. So um, what is the dynamic data economy? Um, so it's a decentralized trust infrastructure uh, acutely aligned with the European data strategy. So um, as many of you know, in, in, uh, in, in Europe, there's been a, a huge drive and quite a lot of finance behind uh, this kind of paradigm shift of, uh, of data management that we're about to embark on. And, uh, and, and really, this is where the actors have, uh, the, the ultimate aim is for actors to have transactional sovereignty to share accurate information bilaterally. Um, but in order to do that, uh, you know, we need to underpin um, these distributed data ecosystems with uh, governance and, uh, and semantics and, uh, and authentication. So this is, a, this is the master mouse model. Um, it's uh, basically a fractal model. So you can use this model kind of internally within an organization or externally within a distributed data ecosystem. And, uh, and one of the things we always say at Human Colossus Foundation is, you know, data is like electricity. So it has value when it flows, but it's costly when it stagnates. And that's really where the dynamic part of the data economy comes, the, the dy uh, dynamic meaning the uh, move, movement. So it's really about the movement of data. Um, so just very briefly, what's in here um, is, uh, you know, everything is citizen centric. Um, and, uh, and we've also got a space here for guardianship. So for instance, uh, if a citizen is, uh, has uh, dementia or something like that, then you know, some, of the, some of the legal authority might be pushed over to a guardian. So that's those two spaces at the top. Um, and then we kind of uh, look at this as very much as a, as a service model. So um, purpose-driven services as opposed to insights-driven services. Uh, Purpose-driven services are, are could be anything from you know a taxi service to a um, you know a, a clinical service, but that's really where new data is captured into these distributed data ecosystems. And on the other side of the model, there is insights-driven services. So um, you know uh, organizations or individuals that are searching for existing data within the ecosystem, and then kind of gluing all of that together is this idea of a data governance administration where they set the policy policy and notice the rules and regulations for safe and secure data sharing within their ecosystem. Um, as I mentioned before, there's, uh, there's uh, synergistic data domains that, uh, that all have to kind of work uh, harmoniously together. Um, and the DDE concept gives equal weight of importance to uh, four core data domains. So the semantic domain, which is really about data capture and objectual integrity within the within the system. Inputs domain is about data in entry, uh, data inputs. So that's about the factual authenticity of the uh, of any events uh, in the system. So any any temporal of, of events. So basically, as soon as you you uh, you mark something with a signature, then you can consider that to be a fact. Um, then there's the governance domain, which is all about data access, and that's really a consensual veracity for the, the policy and notice uh, and regulations uh, for the ecosystem. And then once we've got all of that underpinning the, the, the ecosystem, then finally you can talk about the economic domain, which is about data exchange. And, uh, and we call that transactional sovereignty. So interestingly, in the transactional sovereignty part, that's also where you can have, uh, have you sort out consent, uh, consent agreements. So you can really only agree to something once you have a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with another, uh, another entity, so that's transactional sovereignty. And this is, a, this is a model that's taken us literally, oh, I would say about three and a half years to, uh, to settle on this model. It's taken a long time. I've, uh, I've learned in, in, in this space that patience is a virtue. And, uh, you know, we've listened to experts in all of these domains, the semantic inputs, governance and economic uh, domains. Um, but just very simply, what you can think of it is, is, uh, is the semantic domain is all about objectual integrity, is about the objects in the system. Um, the inputs domain is about the events uh, and the, the, the factual authenticity of events in the system. Uh, the governance is about the rules uh, for policy 
and uh, consensual veracity is the governance domain. And then finally is the economic domain, which is about transactional sovereignty um, and, uh, you know, where you agree to, uh, to um, uh, data sharing and consent. Uh, we have a, a, a stack at Human Colossus that we built, uh, the DDE Trust Infrastructure Stack, and this is very much ordered. Um, so, you know, we say that, uh, you, you know, if you put rubbish into the system, you'll get rubbish out. So we really start with the semantics and the objectual integrity, and that's really about the data harmonization within the, within the ecosystem. Um, that's uh, once you have that, then you can look at the factual authenticity, which is really about the prov data provenance, where the data has come from, um, and to have that uh, like a verifiable uh, or auditable chain of uh, of um, of provenance as the inputs domain. So those two first those first two layers is really all about the machines. It's about cryptographic assurance. And then once we have that uh, the, that digital network in place, then we can put the the human domains uh, on top of that. So you've got the governance domain at layer three, which is uh, as I say the policy and notice and the rules and regulations within a, a distributed data ecosystem. And then finally the economic domain about uh, transactional sovereignty um, between a bilateral exchange in a peer to peer fashion. And those top two layers are, are about human accountability. So we talk about a trust infrastructure is equal to cryptographic assurance plus human accountability. So for this particular series, um, we're really concentrating on the underpinnings of, of enabling that, um, that transactional sovereignty from the economic domain. So we won't go into the economic domain too much, uh, but more about the underpinnings of the, of the ecosystem to enable that to happen. Um, as I said, the DDE is a next generation data agile economy offering a new paradigm in digital living, interaction and growth with a vision of empowering people and businesses to make better informed decisions based on insights from harmonized accurate data framed by sound data governance. Um, so this week I'll be talking about decentralized semantics. I'm very much a, a semantics uh, nerd, if you like. I've been, uh, I've been working in semantics for the past uh, nearly 30 years in the in the pharmaceutical industry, where we have to deal with a lot of data, um, you know, to enable um, drugs to be approved by the FDA or the EMA. Um, so yeah, I know a lot about semantics. So I'll be talking about that this week, um, and then next Tuesday, um, my colleague Robert Mitwicky will talk about decentralized authentication, and then in the uh, the third week, uh, Philippe Page will be talking about distributed data governance. Um, this is what we call the accurate data pyramid, um, and it kind of very much goes about what I said before. So we kind of start with the uh, the data integrity, uh, you know, what is it, um, and that's uh, the deterministic objects. And this is this, uh, or, and traditionally you can think about this as data management. Um, the core the core characteristic here is about data harmonization. Um, once that's in place, you can look at the, the, the next layer, which is authenticity. Where does the data come from? As I said, it's about provenance. Uh, so factual authenticity of the information being entered into the system. Um, and you can think of that as key, key management or keys management. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the third layer there, governance. Um, think about it as access management. So the epistemic rules for um, policy and notice uh, to enable consensual veracity within a distributed data ecosystem. Okay, that's enough of the overview. Uh, I'll get straight into the decentralized semantics part. Um, and really decentralized semantics is thinking, of, it, it's kind of a new way of thinking about semantics. So um, it's really about separating the semantic tasks for maximum interoperability. And uh, as I go through this presentation, you'll get a better idea of what that means. Uh, so first of all, for those new to semantics, what is data semantics? Um, it's the study and the meaning and use of data in any digital environment. In data semantics, the focus is on how a data object represents a concept or, or object in the real world. Um, and within, uh, these, within the uh, semantic domain, um, the core foundational characteristic is objectual integrity. Um, and objectual is an important word here because objectual means not just the objects themselves, but also the the uh, the the relation the the relationship between objects. Um, 
with, within a system. So that's also, uh, a, and integrity here means that um, you always know that, uh, that the identifier of the object is always going to be the same object wherever you see that identifier across any, any data ecosystem. And uh, that provides the overall accuracy, completeness, and consistency of objects and their relationships. Um, in the uh, in the in the four domain model that that uh, I showed you before, um, this is what we'll be talking about today. Is this top left one, um, which is all about uh, digital objects? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't. You can ignore uh, most of the words here. I I won't go into that amount of granularity at this stage because I've got another slide later on that goes into it in a bit more detail. But the important thing to note here is that really data is the kernel of the entire ecos of the entire entire economy. Um, so here you can see that all of those four domains they kind of link to data in whether it's uh, capture, entry, access, or exchange. There's a few core DDE principles for the semantic domain. So we basically uh, we built on top of the the fair um, the, um, the the fair principles, um, which uh, I'm sure many of you have probably heard um, as as you delved into the semantic space. Um, but we really add these four pieces, these four additional items here. So uh, rich contextual metadata, the captured context and meaning, the metadata for all payloads must be rich enough to ensure complete comprehension by all interacting actors, regardless of written language. Structured data forms, so uh, obviously uh, forms for when you capture data. Uh, data governance administrations must publish structured data capture forms, specifications, and standards driven by member consensus for a common purpose or goal that will ultimately benefit the global citizens and legal entities they serve. Harmonized data payloads. Uh, this is really the key here, and I'll, I'll, I'll be going into data harmonization um, a little bit further into the slide, but this is really the, the, the crux of, of, of decentralized semantics and what it can offer. There's two areas of distinction to consider. There's data harmonization, which involves transforming data sets to fit together in a common structure. And then there's semantic harmonization, which ensures that the meaning and context of the data remain uniformly understood by all interacting actors, regardless of how it was collected initially. So harmonized payloads are a must for multi-source observational data to ensure that the data is in a usable format for machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. And then the last one is deterministic object identifiers. And uh, this, is really, this is really important when you talk about uh, you know, distributed data ecosystems, because as I said before, we're, we're looking at a paradigm shift and it's, you're no longer looking at these uh, kind of centralized silos of data where they might be naming their identifiers however they like. As soon as you go into a distributed model, uh, the, the identifiers should be deterministic for all objects. So if the result and the final state of any operation depends solely on the initial state and the operation's arguments, the object is deterministic. So all object identifiers must be resolvable via the object's digest to be deemed deterministic. Um, this is a this is a the uh, digital network model. Um, uh, we also have a socioeconomic model, which is which kind of delves into the governance and economic domains. But really, at this stage, we're we're just talking about the uh, uh, the digital network. So this is really about um, objects and events. Um, the objects obviously sit in the in the in the bottom uh, hemisphere here in the semantic domain, and the events uh, is uh, is about the factual authenticity of what's put into the system. So the data inputs. So that's in the northern hemisphere, and and really we built this model as a yin yang model. Um, you know, so uh, there's always uh, there's always uh, uh, an opposite um, on each side of the model here. So, um, and the way to think about this model is. Uh, we can start with a schema and a record. So um, they're really the persistent objects in those two spaces. Um, a schema um, is uh, really where you add the, 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 structural, um, the structural integrity of the objects. Um, but and then on the other side, you know how that information is stored. It's it's usually stored as a database record, or, or um, so. Yes, yeah, schema and record are, are are the opposites of each other. I separated here the form and the credential. Uh, for those of you working a lot in the SSI space, they talk a lot about credentials, and a credential is a transient object that will allow you to do something. 
but how you capture that information that goes into a credential is usually from a form. So if you think about, you know, your driving license, you know, you have to fill in some information in a form and then you hand that to a, an authority, they stamp it and then they give you the credential, which is your driving license. Um, everything in the semantic domain is about, uh, is, is, has to be deterministic. Um, there was, uh, you probably heard the, um, the term immutable data quite a lot, but well, actually in a distributed system, immutable is, uh, is not particularly useful because you might have a scalability issue uh, with that. So we talk about deterministic, um, deterministic objects in, in this case. And, and really that means that if you have the authorization to, uh, to delete uh, an, an, an instance of an object, um, then that's totally fine. You can do that. It's, it's not immutable, it's deterministic. So wherever that object, that identifier ends up in any system, you know it's the same object. Um, in the middle there, just around the horizon, you'll see that's data entry versus data capture. Um, active and passive. Active basically uh, talks about control. Uh, so obviously, if you enter enter information into a system, um, somebody has to control that information. So you sign it, and then it becomes a fact. Um, on the other side of the model, the semantic domain, um, we don't talk about control at all. It's it's a, it's a, it's a it's a a, 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 a it's a, it's more about a, a language rather than control. Um, and I can kind of explain a little bit about how, if you issue something, how how you can how you know that's issued from a certain legal entity. Okay, so what is decentralized semantics? Uh, it involves separating all semantic tasks into separate objects so that different uh, entities can act as custodians to those granular objects. And I'll show you a couple of diagrams of what that looks like. Well, here you go. That's what it looks like. So. Okay, so this is really about uh, maximizing interoperability uh, within the, uh, the semantic structures within a distributed data ecosystem. So you can kind of think of a capture base as your uh, the, 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 a schema in its most basic form. Um, the only thing that a capture base has is, uh, is it also has a, a flagging block where the, the issuer can flag um, any sensitive information within the capture base. But literally everything else is, 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 a, is a separate semantic object that you can cryptographically link to that capture base. Um, and here, you know, you've got the, obviously you've got this, the semantic, uh, semantic box there, the inputs box, and um, that's the uh, transformation box and the presentation box. And I can go into those in a little bit more detail in a minute. Oops, hang on, I'm just gonna move the chat I've somehow. Oops, go away. Oh, sorry about that, I've just lost my way. Let me see if I can get this chat out of the way. Oh, excuse me, I'm just gonna escape for a minute while I just move that chat. Okay, let me try again. Okay, here we go. Okay, so why do you wanna decentralize semantics? So I thought I'd start this with a question here. So, you know, how can insights driven services perform accurate criteria searches within a distributed data ecosystem that supports semantic properties from several data models or representation formats? So, you know, a good one to think about is, um, you know, the healthcare sector. Uh, in in uh, clinical research, they use uh, data models uh, from CDISC um, in uh, more in the um, exchange of health records in the hospital side, uh, they use uh, HL7 FHIR. And then uh, there's also a big uh, European project called EDEN, E-H-D-E-N. And I just noticed that the data model they wanna use is called OMOP. So, you know, once you, how are you gonna get these, uh, these uh, data models or representation formats to, uh, to be able to understand each other and that's what uh, that's why decentralized semantics is really important so the answer to this question is data harmonization so this is a, 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 a picture of a of a distributed data ecosystem a, a, another uh, another visualization of it but all, all this really shows is that you know the citizens are kind of uh, um, you know they're, they they need to interact with these uh, with these distributed data ecosystems. So you'll see the citizens are all in the ring around the the data ecosystem. Um, the purpose driven services, if you'll remember from the the master mouse model, is uh, is where new data is entered into the system. Um, so in this case, uh, I put here the data capture ring, if you like, and there's a so a bunch of icons for purpose based purpose-driven services. And then kind of pinning all that together is the data governance administration um, for, the, uh, for the ecosystem. 
and you can see a few of the icons in there, you know, the rules, what's uh, the, 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 the legalities behind it, the standards, transparency, policies, requirements, and regulations. Um, okay, so I said that the, 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 core, uh, the core part of, uh, of decentralized semantics is really data harmonization. Uh, you know, there's just no way of being able to find the information you want properly without harmonizing the data. And, uh, and the transformation overlays uh, are, are, can basically be held by the, uh, the purpose-driven services. They can be controlled by the purpose-driven services and then cryptographically linked to a capture base to harmonize that, that information. Um, so you can kind of think of, uh, you know, we've got four transformation overlays I've mentioned here. One's obviously for unit mappings, the other one for attribute name uh, mappings, entry codes, perhaps you need to map those, um, and then standards mapping, you know, you, that, that's more of an informational piece. So, you know, you're going from one standard to another standard. Um, so there's a couple of interesting uh, use cases that uh, decentralized semantics uh, brings about. Uh, one of them is internationalization, um, which is a, a common problem within, uh, within uh, you know, uh, data management. And internationalization is the action or process of making something international. So the internationalization of transient digital objects across distributed data ecosystems is essential for service providers to participate in a global market. Traditionally presenting information for a purpose-driven activity uh, in a language understandable to all recipients um, has involved replicating digital forms, credentials, uh, contracts, receipts into various languages based on user preferences uh, with federated or centralized governance authorities maintaining digital objects in multiple languages. Internal data management in inefficiencies are common to many organizations, institutions, and governments. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so in, in this particular example here, uh, we're looking at... Um, uh, we're really looking at uh, Switzerland as a as a, a quadrilingual country where the national languages are German, French, Italian, and uh, and, a, and a minority language called Romance, which I'm sure not many people on the call will have heard about. Um, so, you know, decentralized semantics is well suited to represent the, this principle uh, in digital information systems. Since Switzerland is a federation the sovereign cantons can define their official language um, according to the primary language uh, spoken in, in, their, in their region. Um, so for instance, here I've said, okay, the Swiss government can be issuing a, a capture base and some core overlays, but maybe some of the, uh, the language specific overlays can be uh, controlled or, or um, have custodianship from uh, the, uh, the cantonal uh, regions, uh, for instance. Um, this is an, another use case is presentation um, and, uh, you know, uh, so this is really about um, the ability to cryptographically bind presentation overlays to the standard capture base uh, used for authentic data entry. Um, so in many presentation instances, the, the legal entity that issues the original capture form may differ from the entity that issues the presentation objects required to produce an associated credential. Um, for example, national passport issuance provides a, an opportuni opportunistic use case to demonstrate the advantages of this particular characteristic. Um, so I don't know if many of you guys know uh, ICAO, I-C-A-O, that's the International Civil Aviation Organization. So they're a specialized agency of the United Nations um, tasked with planning and developing standards for safe international air transport. But they've actually, um, they've got a lot of standards for um, machine readable passports. And, uh, you know, they can define, you know, they could be the, the, uh, the custodian, if you like, of the, of the data capture form for the information for anybody globally to capture the information for a digital passport. Um, however, the, uh, you know, for the presentation objects needed to produce a national passport, um, you know, the, 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 the custodianship uh, would, would, would differ. So as, as an example for Switzerland, the Swiss government is the authority to act as the primary issuer of, uh, in this case, the presentation overlays for the passport, um, whereas maybe ICAO um, could be the, uh, the, the controller of the, of the initial um, capture base. 
and and uh, and some of the core overlays. So it's a really interesting dynamic that we're looking at here. You know, you can really, uh, you know, it, it's really about a multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration in building uh, semantic objects, uh, where literally any of these layers can be controlled by totally different. Uh, legal entities or departments or or uh, different individuals can have authorization for the custodianship of those objects um, so it becomes uh, you know when we talk about uh, semantic interoperability this kind of shows you where the power of it lies okay so the final uh, part of my um, my talk i'll just make sure how am i doing for time yeah not too bad is um is overlays capture architecture so this is a, a global solution for data and semantic harmonization this is a something that that we've been working on in at human colossus for about the last four years and it's really a, a technical uh implementation of what i was talking about regarding decentralized semantics you know what does that look like when it when you bring it to a, a technological um perspective uh, so there's the common uh, uh, the, the common um, diagram that we use, um, and I can go into a little bit more information here about uh, about some of these um, some of these boxes at this stage. So the semantics is really all about the um, the, the the context of of the data, you know, uh, the giving meaning for the the the, the data that you're capturing. Um, and uh, you'll see some of those are kind of language specific overlays. So what that enables you to do is basically, you know, rather than changing the entire semantic structure, if you wanted to change the labels from, uh, um, you know, English into, um, you know, French or, or, or uh, something like that, you could rather than rebuild the entire um, semantic structure, you could just build a, a label overlay. Uh, which in 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 the new language slot that into the into the stack and then at the resolution side uh, you know then you have the the option of going into that new language the inputs uh, box there is all about data inputs so this is where you can put a little bit of control around uh, what people are entering which is obviously really important when you think about um, you know data insights and analytics um, if there's too many freeform uh, text fields floating around, then uh, it becomes a, a, a potential point of attack. Um, but also, more importantly, it's not particularly useful for, for data insights. Um, the, uh, the transformation overlays there, uh, that's really about um, you know, making sure you can go from uh, the, the current way that you're capturing data as a service provider and uh, you know mapping to the uh, to a consensually agreed um, um, data capture specification from the the data governance administration and then finally is this uh, presentation box which allows you to present uh, present different objects still cryptographically linked to the same capture base but uh, different uh, legal entities could be controlling those different objects whether it's a credential or a receipt or a, or a or a contract or um, or a form um, it doesn't matter you know different people can be controlling those okay so what is overlays capture architecture um, it basically represents a form which is domain agnostic and a, and a schema which is more domain specific as a multi-dimensional object consisting of a stable capture base and interoperable overlays i'll just go into that a little bit of the difference between a form and a schema so um, certainly in, you know when i from my experience with clinical data management um, you know usually you would have some sort of uh, um, schema representation as a as a domain if you like so it's uh, you know something like demographics or adverse events you know they would be they would be held as records within two different uh, two different um, domains whereas a form is a domain agnostic so uh, on a form um, you could be um, capturing information that might go into multiple uh, multiple uh, records held on, on on databases if you like if you like so it's domain agnostic so by introducing overlays as uh, task oriented linked objects within the OCA bundle, the architecture off offers an optimal level of both efficiency and interoperability in alignment with FAIR principles. Um, and it's really primarily been devised for semantic object interoperability and privacy compliant data sharing. OCA is a proposed global standard for data capture that promises to significantly enhance the ability to define, manage, and use data in terms of simplicity, accuracy, and allocation of resources. Okay, so why, why OCA? 
Um, so as I said, it, it really offers a solution to harmonizing data between data models and data representation formats. Uh, the key benefit of OCA is that different actors from different institutions, departments, et cetera, can control specific task-oriented objects within the same OCA bundle. In other words, different actors may have dynamic control over assigned overlays rather than the entire semantic structure. Um, object interoperability is uh, in, in a data agile economy where um, multiple um, institutions can participate in complex use cases. So if you think about something like a, a global supply chain, for example, um, this is where OCA can be particularly useful um, because you know you can't you can't expect everybody to be on the same network within a global supply chain and, and able to communicate with each other um, and really oca enables different parts of these semantic structures to be controlled by different people so when you think about a global a global supply chain. Um, for instance, if you're dealing with suppliers in, in Japan, um, you know, the, 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 those Japanese suppliers could be controlling language specific overlays with, with into some of the data objects, which are, are obviously um, um, globally recognized by the, uh, the data governance uh, administration for that ecosystem. Uh, here's some core OCA characteristics. Um, so uh, task-oriented objects, uh, content-bound objects, uh, deterministic identifiers, simplified data pooling, stable capture bases, flagged attributes. Um, I'll show you flagged attributes in a, in a, in a minute. You'll see some code in a second. Um, internationalization, object presentation, composability, uh, OCA is totally on, on, ontology agnostic. Um, and then uh, you know you can have multiple issuers, and it's uh, and it, and it works uh, cross-platform. So what is a capture base? So a capture base is a stable base object that defines a single data set in its purest form, providing a standard base to harmonize data. Um, the object defines attribute names and types. Um, the construct also includes a flagging block, allowing the issuer of a formed or schema to flag any attributes where personally identifying information may be captured. Um, it could be PII information here, but it also just might be sensitive information that the issuer uh, wants to flag, and that's totally fine. We don't say what to do with those flagged objects, but at least they're flagged, right? So as soon as they go into a distributed data ecosystem or across ecosystems, uh, when it comes to encrypting that information, you know that it's already been flagged. So it just means that all corresponding data can be treated as high risk throughout the data lifecycle and encrypted or removed at any stage, re reducing the risk of re-identifying attacks against blinded data sets. Um, for those coders on, on the call, uh, you'll probably be interested in seeing a little bit of code. I'm not going to obviously show you every single overlay because that kind of um, that's uh, that's uh, um, way over the top. We don't need to do that um, because they all work in a similar way, but I'll show you roughly how they work. So you'll see here in the capture base, uh, it's really, there's two, two main blocks here. One's the attributes themselves. So you have the attribute names, and then we've got some core data types that you put in here, and they're defined in the OCA specification, which uh, is the last slide that I'll show. There's a couple of links where you can see those. Um, and then there's this flagged attribute. So that's obviously where you flag any either pers personally identifiable information or sensitive information, you can flag them in that block. Um, and apart from that, it's just a very simple bit of metadata at the top there. So you can see the type of the object is a capture base. And the classification is, uh, is where you can um, put in some broad categorization. So if you wanted to say, okay, this schema has come from the pharmaceutical sector, um, you can put a GICS code, which is a global industry sector classification scheme i think that's what it stands for something like that but basically that uh, eight digit code there uh, it goes quite granular and uh, it enables you to go into a subsector of a of a of a of, a, of an industry sector so you know for for instance uh, something like healthcare it can go down as granularly as um, you know uh, people building medical devices for instance i think that would be an eight digit um, gix code so that, that's all that's in a, in a capture base, very, very simple object. Um, and then what is an overlay? So these are all, all the linked objects that I showed you before. So these overlays are cryptographically linked objects to that base, that base object, and they provide layers of task-oriented contextual information to the capture base. 
So any actor interacting with a published capture base can use overlays to transform how information is displayed to a viewer or guide an agent in applying a custom process to captured data. Uh, and here, this is a, a little bit of code. So we have a whole bunch of uh, overlays. Um, the, the entry overlays are, uh, for me, are, are one of my favorite overlays because I hate freeform text fields. I realize that every now and again, you do have to have them, but I try and, uh, I try and ban them if I could possibly could because um, they're no use for insights and analytics. So the entry code overlay, um, basically, there's two, two overlay types that are kind of linked together. One's an entry code overlay and one's an entry overlay. And the entry code overlay is, 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 is the coded values that you can do your, your insights on or your analytics on. And then the entry overlay is the human readable um, um, uh, version of, of those coded entries. So the entry overlay is actually uh, language specific. So you could change that into multiple different languages, um, but obviously the entry code underneath stays the same. So there's a couple of things in here to show you. Um, you always have a capture base at the top. So that's a deterministic identifier of the capture base. So it's always linked to a specific capture base. And then you see the type here, this is an entry code overlay. Um, and then you have your entry codes here. So, uh, you know, document type in this case, zero equals passport um, um, as your kind of English version, if you like, that's your default. Um, and then where you see these deterministic identifiers for issuing state and issuing state code, I'll show you what that means. So basically, well, what it basically means is that you can point to another deterministic table somewhere. You might have a, a code table with, uh, you know, the code, uh, a bunch of codes. Think about something like country. You'll have like a, the, the ISO codes down one side, and then you'll have the human readable uh, countries, and you could do that in multiple languages. So this just gives a pointer to some of these uh, objects, which may be controlled by, in this case, ISO. Um, and that's it. That's that's all that's in in in, in an overlay, really. Um, and all the overlays are very simple, but they're all task specific, so they're very granular in in what they can do. This is what I just mentioned. If you wanted to cryptographically link to an external code table, you can do that. Um, so a code table, also known as a lookup table, is an array that replaces runtime computation with a simpler array ind indexing operation. Um, the savings in processing time can be significant because retrieving a value from memory is often faster than carrying out an expensive um, computation or input output operation. And an OCA table is just simply just a, a lookup table that OCA can ingest. Um, so this is kind of more of a, a visualization of a, of, a, of a data form. Um, this one's for a data agreement, but it could literally be anything. Um, and uh, a couple of the overlays here, on, uh, I just wanted to kind of show you how, how the different parts of that form are, are, are constructed with different, uh, different overlay types. Uh, I won't do it in this, this particular slide because I, I break it down into uh, separate slides. So, so here's a, a meta overlay. So a meta overlay is a call linked object that defines the contextual metadata about the schema, including the schema name, description, and, and broad classification schemes. Um, so in here, um, we, we separated this object out because when we first built OCA, you know, the entire form was, you, we could translate it into a, a different language, but uh, for, you know, the title of the form and the description was always kind of stayed in the same language. So we separated that out so that, uh, so that that can also be done in, in different languages. Um, an entry overlay, uh, as I just mentioned, an entry overlay is a, a core linked object, defines predefined field values in a specified language. It's good practice to avoid implementing freeform text fields wherever possible to minimize the risk of capturing unforeseen personally identifiable information or quasi identifiable information or sensitive information. Um, this overlay type enables structured data to be entered, thereby negating the risk of capturing and subsequently storing data dangerous data. Um, so you can think of these as, you know, on a form, the, the scroll down of the, of the predefined entries, uh, they're all defined in the entry overlay. And as I mentioned before, there's an entry code overlay underpinning this overlay as well. So they kind of work, uh, work in tandem. Uh, the entry code is about the codes and then the entry overlay can be done in, uh, in human readable languages. Uh, label overlay. Uh, so the label overlay does both, uh, defines both 
attribute and category labels uh, for a specific locale. Again, it's language specific. Um, so it can be done in multiple languages. This overlay type enables all labels to be displayed displayed in a preferred language, language at the presentation layer for better comprehensibility to the end user. And uh, finally, I think this is the last one I'm going to show. As I say, there's a whole bunch more overlays, but these are kind of the core ones that are, are that you'll that you'll pretty much have to use uh, any time that you build a data form. Uh, so the information overlay uh, defines instructional informational or legal pros to assist the data entry process. Um, and, and what's really interesting about the information overlay is, uh, so the information that is displayed on a data capture form might be different to some of the information displayed on a credential for for, for example. And with, by separating out all of these kind of objects, we, we enable that kind of functionality um, between the different data objects. So you can have different information uh, for um, you know different uh, elements, um, uh, yeah, all uh, but all cryptographically linked to the same capture base. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and what's the main significance of transforming different data models and representation formats into OCA? So you have to excuse me. I'm just going to read this slide. Um, the OCA provides a fundamental step in building digital objects that, when resolved at the application layer, maintain the semantically rich definitions to ensure that the meaning and context of data are uniformly understood by all interacting actors, regardless of how it was initially collected. In doing so, all transient objects, uh, when I talk about a transient object, it's uh, things like forms, credentials, contracts, receipts and documents um, plus uh, plus the records. So the records is, is not so much, not so transient. The records are more uh, persistent. Um, but in this case, you could have records held in, uh, in transient containers. So uh, some of you will know things like solid pods or authentic chain data containers or semantic containers uh, where you could have a, a, an authorization credential that provides transitive trust uh, for authorized access into those containers. So all of those sorts of things, um, you know, OCA can deal with. Um, and by, by building it within OCA, you can then start uh, um, working with harmonized data, which when pooled, provide a cleaner fuel for uh, better AI, statistical analysis, machine learning, and other insights-based solutions for a specified purpose. You probably notice that in this presentation, I haven't really talked about uh, AI, and I don't know that AI is a hugely important um, topic, but the way that we look at it is uh, there's no point really looking at ethical AI unless you've got the, the, uh, the data harmonized within these ecosystems so that uh, your AI algorithms are working off uh, accurate data. So in terms of data harmonization, uh, inputted, oops, sorry about that, uh, inputted, uh, Earmarked inputs from multiple sources uh, can serve uh, uh, can serve a, a common purpose, um, but obviously those source inputs need to be transformed into uh, into OCA structures so that you can harmonize the semantics. And only through this data capture process can the benefits of structural and contextual harmoni harmonization occur. Um, there's a couple of links here that you guys might be interested in. I've got the official OCA website there, so you can take a look at that. Um, and also how, how you can contribute uh, to the OCA specification. It's totally uh, open source. Um, the license that we use in there is, uh, is uh, it's a, a, an EU public license at the moment, but it's pretty much the most friendly license that you could possibly use. Um, so we've gone with that one. Um, the only thing that we're trying to do with the licensing is to ensure that, uh, you know, um, that people don't just take the code and rebuild another semantic uh, architecture because that obviously, you know, starts to fragment things again, which we really want to avoid. But, uh, you know, it's really a, this is really a global community uh, initiative to, to build out the build out the specification. And you know we're not we're not we're not going to have covered everything in, in the OCA spec so far. Really, as you get new use cases that are using OCA, we might need to build an, a new overlay type. And uh, you know uh, where it says here how to contribute, um, that GitHub link is where you can ask questions or uh, or you know if you think that uh, that we don't have the overlay types for your use case, then we can go about uh, as a as a as a community building another overlay type to ensure that uh, that uh, that the architecture can deal with your use case. 
So go, go ahead and have a look at those links. Um, I've also uh, put my, um, my email address here. Uh, you're more than welcome to email me directly with any questions. Um, it's uh, paul.knowles at humancolossus.org. Um, and uh, yeah, we're we're a friendly bunch. Uh, we are not. Uh, we're 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 very collaborative in the way that we work. And um, yeah, we look forward to new use cases, new projects, new um, uh, new friends uh, as we as we go. And um, and although we're a nonprofit Swiss foundation, um, you know the reason that we built it in Switzerland is because the foundations in Switzerland are are, are incredibly neutral. And that was really the idea when we built this foundation, um, so that uh, you know there's no uh, there's no risk of of uh of centralization or anything like that with some of the ip at the, at the foundation it's very much meant for uh, for a global contribution so that's everything from my side hopefully <laughs> well thank you so much yeah this was um this is really useful i think uh, you know i think a lot of uh, engineers on the on the calls are normally familiar with, you know, kind of the OCI layer sevens, like one, two, three, four, five, which is used in, you know, data communication application layer. And I think what you've at least set up initially as like these four layers around object input, governance, economics, um, I think gives us a really nice vocabulary to kind of start talking about this. And I think that's really, um, really important. And, um, also, I think people should go to the links that you shared at the end, because if, uh, you know, Paul's been setting the context, but, you know, for those of you who are trying to think about how to even start using it, there are actually libraries and tools around the overlay capture architecture. I can even see like a data form and a view library around there. So even if you want to start doing it in your ecosystem, like, you know, as a business, you know, it may be useful to start thinking about and building on this, uh, building around this stuff to do that. So yeah, the links are, um, I think Paul's just shared it on the chat also. So that's really helpful. Um, and I also like the idea of factual and semantics. Uh, you know, we don't talk so much around all of this um, in this explicit way around presentation versus semantics. We talk a lot more about syntactic transformations and syntax, but uh, you know, the basic challenge in businesses around data capture, uh, you know, catalogs, harmonization, even within organization uh, is, is tremendous. And we don't have a good vocabulary, shared vocabulary across everyone to talk about these layers. Um, Thanks, Amit. Uh, well, just, just on that, on that point, I just wanted to just kind of um, the, the, those four data domains that we've kind of brought there, they've taken a long time to really try and separate those out. Um, and one of the reasons for doing it is, is that we needed we needed a com communal language that everybody could use without tripping over each other. So, you know, obviously yeah. when you, you, when the, when the data management guys talk to the identity guys, you know, they talk a totally different language and, uh, and same with the economists and, you know, the people that are setting up governance frameworks. And just to give you an example, in the economic domain, we were working with somebody that started to use the word attributes. And I said, you can't use that. This is like the data management will go nuts if you take that term. Right. So he said, you know, what term, should I use in the economic space? And I said, well, just think about like everyday life. You know, when you go to an auction, it's the next item for sale is this, or you talk about itemized receipts or, you know, itemized billing and that sort of stuff. I said, your, 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 your core term there is item, use item. And then he, he totally adopted it. And what was cool with that is that, you know, now we can talk to each other and say, okay, we talk about asset exchange and items that's in the economic domain, attributes and, uh, and schemas is kind of left to the data management people and really trying to kind of separate those domains so that was uh it was good fun well it, i'd say it was good fun it was like plucking teeth sometimes but we got there <laughs> no, no i think that's that's really too i i'm gonna wait for some questions but like i think what um and see if there are any questions but let me ask you one i think this uh internationalization example that you shared i i know you've got talked about swiss and the cantons you know, in India, we have the same challenge, right? We have many languages, we have uh, state languages and, you know, federal system, like, like uh, similar, to, uh, similar to other countries, some of the other countries. And, 
I think uh, if what you've just talked about also is quite relevant uh, in terms of thinking about internationalization and localization for governments and public public services in some way. And I feel like at least in India, where we are still in the infancy around that, we have not articulated that all our services have a different presentation layer or a different information layer. So any pointers from how you've seen that happening in your region or in Switzerland that you know you think we could be we should be thinking on just on a public domain kind of services? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, well, the the one thing that I've always always loved about the decentralized semantics is that it, it supports uh, minority languages. So we've done a lot of work with the Canadian uh, provincial governments, and you know they obviously have the First Nations in Canada, where some you know Inukutuk is like a language of the Inuit people, and and those those languages and cultures are in danger of dying. Um, but what's nice about all of this is, you know, it, you know, it enables uh, the, the, the experts in those languages to be able to do the translations and, and have full custodianship of those, of those uh, inform, inform, uh, language overlays themselves. And, you know, and then the, it puts less pressure on the federated system, uh, on the federated government themselves, right? I know that over here, um, Romansh is a, a minority language in Switzerland, but nothing is translated in, 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 in Romansh. And uh, I don't think the, the government could even do it because I don't think they've got the expertise in that language. Needs to go to that canton with uh, that speak that language and they should be controlling those, those languages. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think it's a great point. We should be thinking much more on that direction even here. We have one question from Sankishan. Let me hand it over to him. Sankishan, do you want to come on the mic? And um, yeah, go ahead. I, or... Yeah. So fantastic exposition from Paul. We're looking forward to the next two as well. Like, this is probably the second time I have sat through a presentation on this topic and I've I have made notes. I have a question for Paul that relates to some of the projects that are underway over here, particularly related to citizen services. We have a lot of legacy data. And one of the key things that happens when you're dealing with legacy data and making it more friendly, web free, or call you what you want to call it is, that the project gets bogged down in the data transformation phase, by which I mean that you are taking in data that's in on paper or perhaps OCR digitized in some one way or the other, and then you are transforming it into records that you can manipulate, extract some knowledge out from. If I yep. go back and look at uh, how you describe the workflow, transformation is an integral, but not the start point of things. It's correct. And so my question is that how do you think we should uh, be able to raise the awareness in those projects that deal with legacy data to start looking at the system being transitioned from system A to system B by adopting mm -hmm. some of the principles that uh, today you described? Yeah, no, it's a good question, Sangashan. Um, so, yeah, I think the important thing is that you you're not going to change the way people are not going to change how they capture data um, or they'll do it very reluctantly because they have these legacy systems that they've probably been using for 10 years or longer in some cases. Um, so really, it's just about kind of saying to those people that, you know, you, you can capture data that you want, but if you want to interact within a distributed data ecosystem, whatever that might be, whether it's e-commerce or it's a, it's a, a health or it's a, a financial, doesn't matter. But if you want to interact with those, you know, all you need to do is just build uh, some transformation overlays on your side, which you can control. And then, you know, every time you're pushing uh, or people are requesting data into the data ecosystem, it can automatically be transformed into that, uh, into that kind of um, harmonized solution. Um, and that's kind of a short term, a short term thing, you know, once it once they start doing it that way, then I'm sure they'll think, oh, you know what, it's just going to be so much easier for us to just uh, to, to, to build our data capture straight into into OCA without necessarily having these transformation overlays. But I think that's the first starting point is to kind of really push that, you know, we're not changing the way that you capture data um, at all. But uh, if you want to contribute, um, yeah, you need to kind of work with this, the, uh, the standards as the, the data governance administration has, um, has uh, defined. Great, thank you. Um, oh, okay, 
Paul, uh, let me just ask one last question as we kind of close this and like set it up for, uh, you know, um, for the next two sessions. Um, semantic web. I mean, I, I go back 20 years, the inter initial vision of like the semantic web um, never really panned out. And, you know, I give us some optimism around why this time would be different. Is that? Yeah. Well, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a, a perfectly reasonable question. Um, I just got back from a conference in Helsinki called My Data, uh, the My Data Conference, which is really driven by um, data centric uh, organizations rather than um, rather than the uh, authentication side or the SSI side. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can kind of in that community, you kind of see that there's always like a, a some like a buzzword or buzz topic within and this year, the buzz topic was really data spaces, they call them, which is a horrible term. It's a horrible term because that does, doesn't really mean anything. But basically, the way that the European Union has kind of defined data spaces is what I would call a distributed data ecosystem. And, um, and, and, and the first thing that's coming up in that space, they're not really talking about semantics, they're talking about data governance. How does the data governance work for these, these uh, data spaces? You know, it, some, some of it will be distributed governance, some of it will be federated governance, authorities will probably be, uh, you know, the, the administration is, is usually separate from the authority. So, um, so those are sorts of the, but the cool thing is when you talk about data governance within a, a, a data ecosystem, you very quickly get into the semantic, uh, into the semantic topic, you know, because they realize that within a data ecosystem, you need to search for data and then where do you start, <laughs> right? Okay, let's look at the semantics, right? So, so it's kind of a, a very gentle, semantics is a very gentle approach into governance. And what's interesting in the four domains is that actually the, the, ec the inputs domain and the economic domain are really user user driven so it's more about like so i enter information as a system it comes from me if i have a relationship with you amit it's it's still user led it's between bilateral uh, communication but the other two are really uh, driven by the by the ecosystem so they're ecosystem driven so the governance is ecosystem driven and very quickly as i mentioned so is the semantics because they need to have some sort of agreement on how they uh, they uh, have safe and secure data ex exchange within that ecosystem and that's all semantics. So. Yep. I, I think, thank you so much, Paul, for, you know, giving us a vocabulary, giving us a language, setting this whole, you know, um, lenses around this topic. And especially, you know, I'm hoping people will go back and, you know, share and participate uh, in the open source or the open stuff that you're doing uh, and maybe also bring it to it. I think we in India definitely need it um, and we are far behind on it. I'm hoping we, we at least start thinking about this in the government space uh, for sure. Uh, even, you know, even before businesses, I'm, I'm sure businesses will have their own perspective to it, but, uh, you know, I'm really hoping in public policy it has a big impact. Um, so, you know, this session has been recorded so you know we will have an edited version of this um, up there you can all go to hasgeek.com and privacy mode slash privacy mode and go from there uh, there is a the, there's a link to data slash gov slash and slash sem and you can see the upcoming talks uh, as well as the next two coming talks there's uh, on the same theme there's one by robert on decentralized authentication so we go to, uh, to talk about authentication or credential, in some way, uh, the credential aspect that you saw in the conversation today. And then we'll, Philippe will also come back, uh, Philippe will come back and we'll also talk about, uh, you know, kind of the initial set that Paul showed on our distributed data governance. So how to, uh, you know, make this all work, uh, especially looking at the governance angle of it, right? So this talk was around schema, next one is around, authentication or identity, maybe for some, if that is easier for the thing, then the third one will be going to the human aspect, the key aspect. I think economic, we all kind of buy into, but the governance part, which is gonna be set up, right? I, this is a dialogue and, you know, please, please come back and, you know, you can post comments at the talk. You know, we can continue the dialogue with Paul. He's shared uh, where he's, available, you know, any responses. And if you want to come in and talk about this, um, 
if you want to come and talk around this topic on what you're doing or how you are trying to think about this in the space of privacy or you know data privacy fairness please please to come back there's also a telegram group on privacy mode uh, which is really you know, welcome to join and uh, you know have continue this conversation with like minded people that's at uh, t.me slash privacy underscore mode so uh, you can um, continue the conversation also on telegram well on that note and looking forward to the next two talks, I would like to thank Paul. Thank you so much for uh, spending time with us and setting this up. And we hope to continue this collaboration and this dialogue with you and learn a lot more um, as we have in this session. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks, Sam. Thanks. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for everyone for joining the call. And uh, yeah, any questions? I put my uh, my email in the chat there, so feel free to email me about anything you want. Right. Great. Thanks so much, Amit. Take care, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And well, take care. Have a good rest of the evening. Bye. Bye bye.